My great-grandmother was a Guinea woman. Wide eyes turning the corners of her face could see behind her, her cheeks dusted with a fine rash of jet bead warts that itched when the rain set up. Great-grandmother's waistline was the span of a headman's hand, slender and tall like a cane stalk, with a Guinea woman's antelope quick walk, and when she paused, her gaze would look to see, her profile fine like some obverse impression on a Guinea coin from royal memory. It seems her fate was anchored in that unfathomable sea, for great-grandmother caught the eye of a sailor who ship sailed without him from Lucy Harbor. Great-grandmother's royal scent of cinnamon and scallions drew the sailor up the Straits of Africa, and the evidence is my blue-eyed grandmother, the first mulatta, taken into Bakra's household and covered with his name, and they forbade great-grandmother's Guinea woman presence. They washed away her scent of cinnamon and scallions. They controlled the child's antelope walk, and they called her uprisings rebellions. But great-grandmother, I see your features, blood dark appearing in the children of each new breeding. And the high yellow brown is darkening down. Listen, my children, it's great-grandmother's turn. Good evening. Thank you very much for having me here. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think I'll just jump right in and read a little bit from my, my memoir from Harvey River, a memoir of my mother and her people. And um, I was in Jamaica last week. We were in Jamaica, so I'm very much thinking about Jamaica. Throughout her life, my mother lived in two places at once, Kingston, Jamaica, where she raised a family of nine children, and Harvey River in the parish of Hanover, where she was born and grew up. Harvey River had been settled by her grandfather, William Harvey, who gave his name to the river, and the river in turn gave its name to the village. I do not think there was ever a day in my childhood when the river or the village was not mentioned in our house. Over the years, Harvey River came to function as an enchanted place in my imagination, an Eden from which we fell to the city of Kingston. But over time, I have come to see that my parents' story is really a story about rising up to new life. As a child, I constantly asked my mother about her life before, as she put it, things changed. I listened to her stories, repeated them to myself, and I also took to asking urgent questions of my father. I have an image of me standing outside the bathroom door, calling into him over the noise of the shower. So what was your mother's name? And what was her mother's name? <laughs> but my father's people do not live long. He died when I was 15 years old, so I never did get to ask him all my questions. And after my mother's death nearly 35 years later, I began to dream her, as Jamaicans say. And in those dreams, I continued to ask her questions about her life before and after she came to Kingston. And then there was this one very vivid visitation where I dreamt that I went to see her in her new residence, a really palatial and splendid sewing room with high stained glass windows, where she is now in charge of sewing gorgeous garments for top ranking angels. And she said they were paying a lot, for, a lot for her sewing in this place, and that all her friends came to talk angelic big woman business with her there as she <laughs> sewed. She also said she could not tell me more, as she didn't want me to stay with her too long, because the living should not mix up too much with the dead. But as I was leaving the celestial workroom, she handed me a book, and this is that book. And I'll just read from the first two pages of the, the book. This, it begins with the birth of my mother. The baby was plump and pretty as a ripe ox heart tomato. Her mother, Margaret Wilson Harvey, gently squeezed the soft cheeks to open the tiny mouth and rubbed her little finger, which had been dipped in sugar, back and forth, over and under the small tongue to anoint the child with a gift of sweet speech. Her name is Doris, she said to her husband, David. In later years, my mother preferred to spell her name D-O-R-I-C-E, although in actual fact, she was christened D-O-R-I-S, but she was registered under a different name altogether, Clara Bell. This came about because of a disagreement between her parents as to what they should call their seventh child. Her father, David, was a romantic and a dreamer, a man who loved music and books, and an avid reader of lesser-known 19th century authors. He had read a story in which a heroine was called Clara Bell, 
and he found it to be a lovely and fitting name. He told his wife Margaret that this was to be the baby girl's name. Well, Margaret had her heart set on Doris because it was the name of a school friend of hers, a real person, not some made up somebody who lived in a book. Doris Louise, that was what the child would be called. They argued over it and after a while it became clear that Margaret was not going to let David best her this time. He had given their older ch other children names like this. Cleodine, Alberta, Edmund, and Flavius. <laughs> Lofty sounding names, which were rapidly hacked down to size by the blunt tongues of Hanover people. Cleobertha, Eddie, and Flavi. That was what remained of those names <laughs> when Hanover people were finished with them. Margaret had managed to name her firstborn son Howard, and her father had named Rose. Simple names for real people. There was nobody who could be as stubborn and as hard-headed as Margaret when she set her mind to something. She was determined the baby was not going to be called Clarabelle. Sound like a blasted cow name, she said. <laughs> David gave up arguing with his wife about the business of naming the pretty, chubby-faced little girl, especially after Margaret reminded him graphically of who exactly had endured the necessary hard and bloody labor to bring the child into the world. He dutifully accompanied her to church and christened the baby Doris on the last Sunday in June 1910, and then the next day he rode into the town of Lucy and registered the child as Clarabelle Louise Harvey. <laughs> And he never told anybody about, anybody about this for 15 years. As a matter of fact, he was never actually known to have ever told anybody about it because the family only found out when my mother tried to sit for her first Jamaica local exams for which she needed a birth certificate. And when she went to the registrar of births and deaths, they told her that there was no Doris Louise Harvey on record, but that there was. There was a Clarabelle Louise Harvey born to David and Margaret and Harvey Nay Wilson of Harvey River, Hanover. She burst into tears when she heard what her real name was. <laughs> Clarabelle got to hell, her brothers chanted. <laughs> when the terrible truth was revealed. Not one to take teasing lightly, she told them to go to hell their damn selves. <laughs> Eventually, her name was converted by deed pool to Doris. Thereafter, she signed her name D-O-R-I-C-E, as if to distance herself from the whole Clarabelle Doris Doris business. Besides, Doris conjured up images of a woman who was not ordinary. And to be ordinary, according to my mother's sister, Claire Dine, was just about the worst thing that a member of the Harvey family could be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'll just, I know you must be wanting to go home, so I won't keep you long. But, all right. <laughs> you want another story? All right, okay. Another story. All right, this is... Okay, I grew up with something called a cautionary tale. Are you familiar with the cautionary tale? My mother had a cautionary tale for everything you did. <laughs> what, whenever and you did something, she knew a little girl exactly like you who had done that same thing, and the child came to a bad end, <laughs> very bad end. So that is how I was raised, with a cautionary tale. And um, so this cautionary tale is about somebody called the don't care girl. Um, my mother, my mother, my mother's sons, she, I think her mother was very fond of, you know, telling stories like the don't care girl. But really this concerns my aunt Anne, who was my favorite aunt, and she was a bit of a don't care girl. So um, this is about the don't care girl. Now that all her children had left the house, Anne became the object of her mother's homilies on how sorrow followed closely to joy, as surely as the night followed the day. Therefore, one should not be too laughy-laughy, so quick to pop stories, and want to go to fairs and concerts and dances with unsuitable friends. She, Margaret Wilson Harvey, as everybody knew, had a deep mistrust for anything resembling excess happiness. And just to prove herself right, look how she had gone and forgotten and been so happy with her son Howard 
and had not God taken him from her? Had her other son, Edmund, not run away to Kingston never to return? Had God not allowed a spark from the cane boiling fire to cool into a cloud into her left eye? Had not Georgia Brown Wilson's legal family been allowed to cut her out of his will, rob her out of the house and land in Lucy, yet specifically willed to her after she had cared for him in the last years of his life? Her daughter Anne needed to learn from her mother's misfortunes. And if she did not want to learn from her mother's misfortunes, she should at least learn from that cautionary tale about an own way girl who had come to a bad end in a village near Harvey River. The girl, it was said, suffered from a powerful case of don't care. She never listened to a word that her mother said, and she liked to laugh loudly and to sit down bad. That is, she would not sit with her legs closed and crossed at the ankles, preferably slanted to the side, so that others would not be able to look up under her dress. This girl loved to dance, and she ignored her schoolwork and took to sneaking out of her parents' house at night and going to dances in the company of some other no-good giggling don't-care girls <laughs> from neighboring villages. Loud laughing common girls. Well, one night she slipped out and there it was she met her fate. The girl danced till nearly morning to the titillating beat of the merry wang and the frowsy rub up mento. No doubt, she danced the Penny Reel O, a very slack song, with lyrics like, Long time me never see you, and you owe me little money. I beg your tiny belly, give me, make me rub out my money, Penny Reel O. The dawn was rising over Hanover when she finally returned to her parents' home, but they had locked and bolted the doors and windows. So she sat outside in the yard on a stone, shivering in her long satin dance dress with the back plunged low. And as she sat there, it came to her that she should go and have an early morning bath in the river. She went down to the cool river, which in the dawn hours was a light jade green, the color of young jimbelins. The water was deliciously cold and surprisingly warm, and she swam and swam until the sun came up fully over the village. She had no towel, so she rose up out of the water and put on her dance dress over her wet skin. And to the eternal disgrace of her family, she walked home with her wet satin dress clinging to her voluptuous form, her hair long and dripping wet across her shoulders in thick ringlets, cool and relaxed. She walked towards her parents' home and met them coming down the one street in the village dressed in their church clothes. <laughs> They passed each other in the square and never exchanged a word. But the entire village witnessed the shocking scene. And by the time her parents reached the church, the parson had put together a fiery impromptu sermon about harlots and loose women. This incident was in fact a blessing for him because he had planned to preach one of his old stale standbys about the prodigal son. Well, do you know that that terrible don't care girl died soon thereafter? Probably from pneumonia or TB, which according to Hanover people, she had contracted by wearing low cut dresses which exposed her lungs. <laughs> That's the kind of thing my, mother, my mother's people live in. I think I'll just read some poems now from my newest book. It's called, uh, it's called Supplying Salt and Light. And this first poem is called To Make Various Sorts of Black. And according to the Craftsman's Handbook, chapter 37, Il Libro dell'Arte by Cennino d'Andrea Cennini who tells us there are several kinds of black colors. First, there is a black derived from soft black stone. It is a fat color, not hard at heart, more a stone unctioned. Then there is a black that is obtained from vine twigs, twigs that chose to abide on the true vine, offering up their bodies at the last to be burned. Then quenched and worked up, they can live again as twig of the vine black, not a fat, more of a lean color, 
favored alike by vine dressers and artists. There's also a black that is scraped from burnt shells, markers of the Atlantic's graves, black of scorched earth, of scorched stones of peach, twisted trees that bore strange fruit. And then there is a black that is a source of light from a lamp full of oil, such as any thoughtful guest waiting for bride and groom who cometh will have. A lamp you light and place underneath, not a bushel, just a good clean everyday dish that is fit for baking. Now bring the little flame of the lamp up to the undersurface of the earthenware dish, see a distance of about two or three fingers away. And that smoke that emits from that small flame will struggle up to strike a clay. Strike till it crowds or collects in a mess or a mass. Now wait, wait a while please. Before you sweep this color, no sable velvet soot off onto any old paper or could sign it to shadows, outlines or backgrounds. Observe, it does not need to be worked up nor ground. It is just perfect as it is. Refill the lamp, Chanini says. As many times as the flame burns low, refill it. Now, the, the poems in this book begin in Spain and Portugal, and my darling husband, Ted, was, was so kind enough to drive me down here through the rain and the wind. Thank you, sweetie. Um, and I went with, to, to Spain and to Portugal, and I remembered when I was there a story. My mother was a very good teacher of small children, and she told me the story that when Christ, Christopher Columbus went to report, report back to Queen Isabella what financed his voyage, you know, she would say to him, well, what did this island look like and what did it one look like? When they got to Jamaica, he said it was the fairest isle that eyes had ever beheld. And he wanted to show what it looked like, so he crumpled up a piece of parchment and let it go to show that Jamaica's very mountainous. So this is poor Miss Gore reporting back to Queen Isabella. When Don Cristobal returned to a hero's welcome, his caravels corked with treasures of the new world, he presented his findings, told of his great adventures to Queen Isabella, whose speech set the gold standard for her nation's language. And when he came to Examica, he described it so, the fairest isle that eyes ever beheld. Then he balled up a big sheet of parchment, unclenched, and let it fall off a flat surface before it landed at her feet. And there we were, massifs, high mountain ranges, expansive plains, deep valleys, one he'd christened for the Queen of Spain. Over abundance of wood, over 100 rivers, food and fat pastures for Spanish horses, men and cattle. And yes, your majesty, there were some people. <laughs> this poem is called You Should Go to Toledo because I'm, I, I studied art, you know, lot, all of my, this is one of my paintings on the cover of my book, but um, I was, I'm a big fan of El Greco. So I was you know, eating dinner one night and somebody kept saying you should go to, I said I liked El Greco and they said you should go to Toledo. So this poem is called You Should Go to Toledo. I'd stared hard at the tongues of flame over the heads of the disciples. I felt a dry heat catch fire in my fontanelle. El Grec, the docent in the Prado called him a stranger in Spain all his days. What is it you like about him, the one who came from the dark night inquires? So I say this, the way his figures struggle and stretch till they pass the mandatory seven heads must be about grasp exceeding reach. The overturning of my temples, the slant sideways of seeing that open as I approach his door-sized canvases and his storm at sea all dolorous blue and his bottle green washing to chartreuse, and his maroon stains of dried ox blood. The verdigris on the sheen of the black coat, white lace foaming at the throat and wrist of a knight with one hand to his chest. How I cling to the hem of the garment of La Trinidad's broad beam angel, who resembles my own mother when she was young, strong, and healthy body able to ease the crucified down of the cross. And he who separated from the shades 
and sat at table with us in a late night place, redolent with olive oil and bacalao said, then you, you should go to Toledo. New sketches of Spain. This train I board at La Latina will stop next in Arangues where Rodrigo lived. As a boy, he lost his sight. A friend became his eyes. One day he was blessed with a fine looking wife. His duende created major disturbances in his head. Still he composed the concerto de Arangues for Spanish guitar. Did no one tell that to Miles Davis? The concerto de Arangues is gardens of aromatic camellias, plaintive exquisite bird song, sudden exuberant fountains, a small child's death. These things I have read. Train from La Latina, take me to Arangues. I must pay respect due to Rodrigo for myself. We did not stop in Toledo. I watched it frame itself through the window of the Madrid train. I acknowledge El Grec's broad brush plains, oak and green, the rolling dry brush hills, the old olive trees, the long light glancing off storied buildings within which highly skilled craftsmen still discipline hot steel into swords. And there were lines of laundry strung across balconies or brutalist apartment blocks, not far from the site where St. John of the Cross, all but immured, suffered his way into song source, praise and thanks canticles out of dark night. Source wash, wash these words, wash my heart. Go forth and exult in your glory. Hide yourself in it and rejoice. Tell it to Teresa of Avila, advised the thin priest, to whom you confessed that in divers times you'd left your body behind as your weightless core sifted up towards ceiling. There is no one more able to understand than Teresa, who at times had to cling to what was bolted down to anchor herself from being hauled up into ether, taken home before her time. Bookmarks for eyes. Enter the old puppeteer. He creaks the stairs to the upper room where we sit at late dinner in an inn where a bronze plume bird perches on top of the cold water tap in the ladies' toilet. Turn the water on. It trills like it's in a bird bath. That bird should be released over the aqueducts, perhaps to swell the high chorus of swallows in the gilded choir loft of the great cathedral. The old puppeteer comes. He has reduced his craft to two from three dimensions. He sells stiff paper figures with black beads glued on, still damp and bulging as eyes. Bookmarks, he says, they will keep reading for you long, long after you close your eyes. <laughs> so we buy a purple one and pray that it will not stain our sincere tries at clear, clean prose. What do you want from me? All I desired was a quiet life, grafting poems onto roses, singing slow at home near blue mountains. What am I searching for outside of this known world? Why am I a fall of fashion Columbus, gone off map, and here they be dragons? I'll just read a couple more of the Spanish poems. This is called O Lisboa. San Vincente, patron saint of Lisbon, stands in the Largo das Portos de Sal and cradles a model boat with mariners and two ravens. He oversees the harbor from the square of the sun's gates. He guards Alfama's teak cobble streets. His crawled marble robes have gone deep off white. Once a ship docked off the Gambia coast and took into its hold, unknowns to all, a small stowaway, a boy barnacle, juvenile remora, fastened onto bark, then slipped off ship in Spain. 
This boy turned man crossed into Portugal and addresses Monica and me as my mothers. He sells us bead necklaces he strung himself, amber and an inkstone so blue, it's all but black, same as his own skin is in reverse. He gifts us leather bracelets, says, thank you mothers for talking to me. Says he's going to buy supper for his children and their mother. She, like him, is Senegalese. He becomes furtive when a marked car rounds the corner, whispered, Policia, San Vincente, tent your stone palm, shelter the ravens. I have to give you a little backstory. This, this, this poem is about going into a store in the Alfama district and seeing a, a little sa a wood carving of a saint. It was about 18 inches high and she was very beautiful face, and, but she, was tar she had no clothes on, but they had painted on her underwear, I get for in the event that such a thing would happen to her one day. So she was, it was, it was a very lovely, I wish I'd, I could have bought it, it was very expensive, but she was just sitting there with her uh, underwear painted on. So, this, <laughs> so the poem is called La Casa dos Dorados. The shop of saintly relics, you call it, where she was on display in her painted on underwear. And the clerk dissembled when pressed to identify the icon of a black woman, one ruler and a half high, limbs hinged so she sat upright on a ladder back chair, knees together, feet sheathed in ankle boots, straight laced, sweet faced, embarrassed to be seen, not properly dressed in a shop window in the Alfama district. You insist you need to know who she really is. You wait till the owner is summoned. His best guess is, she is our lady of Montserrat, black Madonna. What could have brought her to this? Why has she stripped off her clothes to expose her thin white tempera, chemise and bloomers? Our lady's home is on a Barcelona mountain. Attempts to bring her to the plains fail. Believers make pilgrimage to her shrine of miracles but she's come down to us this day. You're in the valley of the shadow, the dark. Lady has come to accompany you through this place on the path where consolations withdraw. Do like her, be still, and yield up all outer. So, <laughs> so poem about Christopher Columbus. In days of sail, Don Cristobal embarked for Sipangu and in India. Give him propers. He was no coward, Genoan and his crew in three ramshackle ships. Imagine setting forth across the vast shoreless ocean of ambition, not knowing if they'd slip and fall off the edge of a sky-wide water world. I too these days share that exact same concern. I too do feel as if the blessed isle I set sail for is not the one on which I have made landfall. Like Don Cristobal, I could refuse to admit to being lost. I could just bring it off, call it what it is not. Hearties, hearties not. Uh, <laughs> or I just, I wanna, it's quite late so I won't go on too much here. Um, a Toronto, po a couple of Toronto poems. Ideas of home. Winter has landed my boot box on a stone surrounded by a cold. I swear I murmur over a cabeza. The rock is what I call home, all islanders do. And I'm in blessed Ann Arbor, mainland where I found safe harbor on the green sea of trees now becalmed, frosted. Ideas of over a cabeza propel me forward down the Straits of Packard, past the Jewel Heart Center, where a wild weed poet is ash earned behind red doors. I stop and pay respect due him, then I'm urgent, in need of touchdown upon the ground of my being, on haste to enter into the land of spices, discoverer within sight of gold fields. Ideas of home propel me up Parliament Street straight past a jet fuel cafe where machines froth and foam fair trade coffee. 
and writers and artists sit in window seats to divine from flat glass screens. Do I dare go in, sit with them and drink peach tea? A girl poet hails a youth with a rhombus of a red bicycle riding over one shoulder. Ah, I see you are carrying your steed. An actor of a certain age, recognized from real movies, not straight to DVDs, is fed this line by an older man. The street is really changing. The actor registers sadness to hear this. And I have little knowledge of the city's changes. But this is what I have come to believe. This Toronto street at times seems like an El Greco painting, a humming heavenly highway, alive with every type of human being out and about their business. And in late fall, in the late fall light, they appear transported, holy rolled, at peace, as if they've eaten their fill of Ontario corn and bushels, bushels of ink blueberries. I'll, I'll just read one more poem. Um, this is for my husband, Ted. And the, okay, here's the thing. He's a, he's a really beautiful human being. He really is a lovely man. No, he really is. I, I'm, I'm not joking. He is. He's the best. But he told me a lie. <laughs> we, we've been married for 13, almost 14 years. And one, he just told me a big lie once. And here's how he told me this lie. When I, we got married in 2000 and I came here, we lived in Toronto, and it was fine, and it was lovely. And, and then he was, he was born in British Columbia, and at some point he, we, anyway, we got a house in British Columbia, and it's lovely, it's by the water, and we've subsequently moved out to British Columbia. A place called Half Moon Bay, just a beautiful one, it's gorgeous, beautiful place. But I said to him, sweetie, there's one thing I want to say to you. Now that we no longer live in Cabbage Town, which is the heart of the city, I have a great fear of bears. I have read and seen on the television that bears often do bad things to people. <laughs> and, um, and he said to me, my darling said, he said, sweetie, there are no bears in British Columbia. He, says <laughs> <laughs> he did. He might even have said that bears don't like being near the sea, which you know is a lie. <laughs> so I, I chose to believe him, as I believe him about everything else, and then we moved out to British Columbia, and then one evening we were coming back from Gibson's, and lo and behold, a bear was just crossing the road, just like that. <laughs> just like this bear. And this bear was the most, he was cool. He walked like President Obama. You know, President Obama has a kind of bopping walk. He kind of like, <laughs> and, and this is exactly how the bear was proceeding. And no, he was in no hurry. And he just walked across the road. And I could feel Ted beside me, willing me not to see the bear. Like you said, <laughs> there is no bear in the road. And I said, but there's a beast right anyway. So, yeah. So this poem is called a bear. Oh. There he was, great bear of my dreams, crossing the road just outside Gibson's in no particular hurry. Like a long-legged pigeon-toed man with a gait presidential, bopping, cool, bear just ambled, slightly shambolic, dipped in front of the car. My heart leapt. You, love, were hoping I had not seen it. I did, but wasn't as scared I, as I imagined I'd be upon my first bear sighting. Ursa down from the evening sky, slipped through banks of pine trees, never broke even one branch. For him, the green parted. Last night, the bear was dancing in a ring with our children. I called to you, Papa, come quick. The kids aren't aware there's a bear they're cavorting with. But they seem comically happy out there. And the bear trail a lad across Half Moon Bay. And now the bear enters into our living room, 
where a lamp shaped like a horse waits to be unpacked. I show it with a damp dishcloth. It shows no sign of being even one bit perturbed. And I am wondering if the bear is thinking of moving in. <laughs> if you will sit in our armchairs, eat up our porridge. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs>